The Assassin's Creed movie is different from many other live-action video game adaptations in that it directly ties into the timeline and story presented in the games it is based on. And there are many elements of connection between the movie and the Assassin's Creed games, and also many subtle connections within the movie itself that I found very interesting as I watched it for the first time recently. So, I thought I'd share what I found and walk you through some of the callbacks to game history and also other interesting themes that the movie presents. If you've never seen the movie before, or if you're just curious if you missed something in it that I caught, I hope I can share some interesting insights with you all today. And as a quick note before I get started, I am far from an expert on Assassin's Creed, so I'm sure I didn't catch everything. And spoiler warning, I do mention some major plot points for not only the movie, but also some of the games. Let's begin! The film starts us in Spain, 1492, where we are introduced to the ancestral hero of this story, Aguilar de Neja. Immediately we have a common theme here. The name Aguilar means eagle, a nod to how other Assassin's Creed heroes' names often mean eagle, like Altair, Ezio, and Arno. Aguilar is being officially initiated into the Assassin Brotherhood, reciting the creed, receiving his own hidden blades, and having his right ring finger removed, as we see became tradition back in Assassin's Creed Origins. The story is that Bayek, a founder of the Brotherhood, lost his finger accidentally while using the hidden blade. Those after him willingly cut off their finger as a symbol of dedication to the Brotherhood, and also to prevent such accidents from happening to them as well. We see that this continued as a tradition into the events of Valhalla and Assassin's Creed 1. However, by the time of Ezio and Assassin's Creed 2, things had changed. Leonardo da Vinci points out that Aldehir's plans for the blade have now made it safer, so it is not possible to easily cut off your own finger with it. Consequently, during his assassin initiation, Mario Auditore tells Ezio that in the modern age, they simply brand the ring finger instead. So this comment about the modern age then becomes interesting, considering Aguilar's initiation happens four years after Ezio's in 1488. The Spanish Order of Assassins must have retained the tradition longer than the Italian Order did. Another interesting thing to consider in these scenes of the past in the movie are that they are fully spoken in Spanish. The games that involve non-English speaking people usually will have some lines and words said in those other languages, but mainly spoken in English. But this movie went with the full immersion of pure Spanish, so it stands out in that unique way. After Aguilar's initiation, we then are introduced to the modern day hero of the film, Callum Lynch. We see the backstory of how his father, an assassin, killed his mother as Templars arrived at their home, which is what caused Callum to run away in fear and become an orphan at a young age. And as we see the Templars arrive, we get our first glimpse of the high-ranking Templar, Alan Riken. Alan Riken was actually first shown in the very first Assassin's Creed game as the CEO of Abstergo, the man who ordered to have Desmond Miles killed until Lucy convinced him not to. Alan Riken is still the head of Abstergo in this film, meaning that his role hasn't changed in the past four years, from 2012 to 2016. And in this flashback, he was likely still the head of Abstergo, so he was the CEO from 1986 to 2016, if not longer. As we go from the past to 2016 in this film, we see that adult Callum is now in prison. There are a few interesting things in this scene. The first is the drawings that Callum is making. They are obviously very telling of his anguished mental state, but also might be showing some connections to the memories of his ancestors even before reliving them in the Animus. We see a king, as well as someone being stabbed by a spear, and a cross. These are reminiscent of Aguilar's experiences during the Spanish Inquisition, as Aguilar was watched by a king as he was going to be burned at the stake, the obvious religious connections with the cross, and all of the fighting, some of which involved spears, which we even see in at least one fight in this movie. Callum is about to receive the death penalty for murder, so a priest comes into his cell to try and save his soul before he is killed. Callum is uninterested, and the priest says, You're not much for the Bible, are you? This is potentially a reference to how the assassins tend to view religion. The Templars often use religious power to control people into blindly following them, which obviously goes against the assassins' wish for free will and free thinking. Nothing is true is part of their creed, after all. But Callum wakes up after being executed to learn that he is still alive, having secretly been taken by Abstergo while the rest of the world thinks he is dead. He is told all of this by Dr. Sophia Riken, the daughter of Alan Riken. Sophia is the head of the Animus Project at this facility in Spain. And Sophia is where we get even yet another connection to the plot of the games. Sophia is mentioned in Assassin's Creed Origins, where we learn that she has a history with the modern day hero of that game, Leila Hassan. Sophia is the one who offered to get Layla a job at Abstergo, and Layla is the one who gave Sophia many of the ideas for the version of the Animus used in the film, which Sophia took without credit, as we learn in the game. 
The aspect of stolen credit is also used in the movie when we see that Alan Riken has taken his daughter's work without credit multiple times. She probably learned it from him. This other detail is probably completely unintentional, but I noted that the DR on Callum's prison uniform, that obviously stands for Death Row, could also stand for Dr. Riken, as he is under her watch at Abstergo. But maybe that one's a reach. Callum tries to escape, so Sophia reassures him that he is not a prisoner there. She only wants his help working on her Abstergo project, which is to perfect humankind and eradicate violence. There's obviously an illusion of choice here, because they tell Callum that he is free to do what he wants, but constantly control him. Indeed, they tranquilize him during that conversation, so he can't go anywhere, even though they said he is not a prisoner. I think that's what they were subtly getting at in a later scene of the movie where Callum is getting lunch. The Abstergo employee says, It's an open menu, but we do recommend the chicken. They're trying to push him in the direction of getting him to follow what they want him to do, but they need to give him the illusion of choice because the animus won't work if he is forced into it. Of course, Callum opts not to eat the chicken, a sign that he will turn against Abstergo in the end. The animus in this movie is the Animus 4.3, in which the user fully experiences the movement of the memories, unlike the other animi, which leaves the user in a sitting or lying position, more fully unconscious, like what we see in the games. This arm of the Animus is what is mentioned directly in Layla's emails to Sophia in Origins. Sophia needs Callum to relive the memories of Aguilar in the Animus so that they can find where he left the Apple of Eden, which was in his possession. Sophia wants to use it as a tool of science to eliminate all violence, but the other Templars, like her father, of course, want to use it more as a tool of general control over people. Typical Templar behavior. As we're introduced to the Animus experience in this movie, an interesting part of the first memory of Aguilar is the rope launcher that he uses briefly. The rope launcher is a tool used in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, something used by the English assassins of the late 1800s to the early 1900s. A modified version made by Alexander Graham Bell of a grappling hook taken from a Templar, Rexford Kaylock. So it's interesting to see a version first used by an assassin way back in 1492 before that happened. After he goes through the memory, Callum starts experiencing the bleeding effect, as introduced in Assassin's Creed 2, where after using the Animus, the past and present start merging together. As in the games, this helps Callum gain Aguilar's fighting abilities, just like Desmond began gaining skills from Altair and Ezio. And Callum keeps seeing Aguilar attacking him, which might be referring to how Callum wants to destroy his troubled past, but it relentlessly keeps coming back to haunt him. It's confronting him. Sophia questions Callum's violent history that led him to jail, where we learn that the man Callum killed was a pimp. I believe this could be another example of Callum experiencing his assassinhood before he knew he was an assassin, just as we saw his affinity for parkour at a young age. This is because killing a pimp could have the implication that Callum was trying to protect prostitutes. As we see starting with Ezio's trilogy, assassins have a lot of connections to prostitutes. The assassin Paola is the owner of a brothel, where the courtesans often helped assassins by distracting guards for them. Similarly, in the Jack the Ripper story for a syndicate, we see many examples of assassins who were disguised as prostitutes that became victims to the killer. So I definitely think that there's some meaning there with having Callum kill a pimp and the subtle assassin connection behind that. Sophia tells Callum that she believes there is a link between heredity and crime, that he has a troubled past because he is a descendant of a killer like Aguilar. There's a slight link there between Callum and the other modern day heroes Desmond and Layla in that they are a bit predisposed to trouble as well. Desmond ran away from home when he was a teenager, and Layla also has a rocky history of going back and forth from strictly following rules to making her own way against what she is told. So Sophia is trying to tell Callum that having assassin blood is partially to blame for his problems. Sophia and Alan Riken are using the death of Callum's mother to fuel him into working for them and helping them retrieve the Apple of Eden, as they inform Callum that his father was an assassin. His father is actually there at the Abstergo facility and tells Callum that he killed his mother so that Abstergo wouldn't capture her and force her into the Animus as they did with him. So he tells Callum that the Apple must be free, just as other descendants of assassins being held by Abstergo told Callum. But Callum is fueled by revenge and wants to go against his father's wishes, so he goes back into the Animus to help Sophia. During all of this, we also see that Callum's mother's necklace is actually something that Aguilar's closest friend and fellow assassin Maria gave to him, meaning it was passed down for many generations of Aguilar's descendants. Callum goes back into Aguilar's memories, during which Maria dies to save the apple from being taken from the Templars. 
This is definitely a big theme in this area of the movie, of giving up one's life to prevent the Templars from winning. Because we see that not only with Maria, but also with Callum's mother. Callum was against protecting the apple because his father forced his mother to protect it by killing her, and he wanted his own free will to decide. Ironically enough, as not protecting the apple means the loss of free will. I think in Maria's death, which she willingly accepts as a possibility, Callum sees the power of choosing to die for the right cause, and that's what ends up changing his mind once it's all over. They learn through the memories that Aguilar gave the apple to Christopher Columbus for safekeeping, so Riken and Sophia plan to go to his grave to obtain it for the Templars. The other assassins in the Abstergo facility try to fight back to stop them, and as Callum is confronted by these memories and his ancestors, including his mother, he realizes, like I just said, that he has to protect the apple from the Templars to save free will. He fights alongside a few minor characters we were introduced to along the way in the movie, who are descendants of characters from the games. Baptiste from Liberation, Yusuf from Revelations, Duncan from Black Flag, and Xiao Jun from Chronicles. Baptiste is the only one mentioned by name, but all of them were directly shown in a scene that was cut from the movie. And you can tell who the other characters are to an extent, especially Xiao Jun's descendants since she uses the very unique hidden blade shoe. As Callum sees his ancestors, there are another two very interesting things of note. The first is that we learn that he is a descendant of Arno Dorian, the hero from Assassin's Creed Unity. So consequently, Arno is potentially a descendant of Aguilar. Sophia also sees an ancestor that looks just like her, potentially implying that Sophia is also related to Callum. I'm guessing this was going to be addressed in the sequel to the film, but that was unfortunately cancelled. But maybe we'll learn about it more one day. The Rikens escape, but the assassins track them down at a big Templar meeting. Before going to take the apple from the Templars, Callum talks to Sophia, who is now upset to have learned that her father wanted to control people with the apple, instead of healing them from aggression, which was all she wanted. During Callum's conversation with distraught Sophia, he repeats two lines back to her that she had previously said to him as reassurance. Kind of in an ironic way, since everything she was saying would help him, obviously it did not. It's nothing big, but there are simple lines that could be easy to miss, so I thought I'd just point it out even though it's simple. I am here to help you. And you are here to help me. I'm here to help you. And you're here to help me. I can't do this. Yes, you can. I can't do this. Yes, you can. We then get a very classic assassination scene where Callum kills Alan Riken, very reminiscent of some missions in the games. The assassins take the Apple of Eden and escape, and that's how the movie ends. A final big thing to note here at the close of the film is that there was supposed to be another, more important side character in the movie that was ultimately cut. A 13-year-old assassin raised by the Rikens into being a Templar named Lara. In these deleted scenes, we see even more threads of connection that could have deepened the story. Lara drew a lot of pictures based on past memories, which would seem to solidify the theory that that was what Callum was doing at the beginning. Lara was also supposed to be a descendant of Maria, so that was going to give her a bond with Callum as Maria and Aguilar were best friends. And instead of seeing that she is a descendant by using the same actress as with the other assassins, as obviously Maria was not 13 years old in 1492, we see that Lara wears her hair in the same style that Maria did. And finally, there was an ending scene before the assassins went to take the apple back from the Templars, where Lara showed Callum that she had stolen a book from Abstergo. It shows the plans for the Hidden Blade, which could very well be related to the codex that Leonardo da Vinci decoded for Ezio in Assassin's Creed II, which showed Altair's plans for the Hidden Blade. So there are many subtle connections not only to past Assassin's Creed games, but also to other themes within just the Assassin's Creed film that add more layers of depth to the overall story. I especially find the connections between Sophia and Layla interesting, because Sophia stealing Layla's ideas was potentially the catalyst for Layla starting to go her own way apart from Abstergo and becoming an assassin. But also within that, Sophia was a victim of having her work stolen as well. But despite her father stealing her work and turning it into something she didn't want with the apple, she was still devastated by his death and seemed to want direct revenge on Callum at the end of the film. So there are a lot of interesting things in the complexity of characters like Callum and Sophia in true Assassin's Creed fashion. Consider Templar's stories like Shay and Haytham in the games. I think this movie is a great addition to the series, and I definitely recommend giving it a watch if you haven't already. I know some people don't like it at all, but I think that they did a great job with the story, and the real stunts and fight scenes are all fantastic. There are lots of fun, familiar mechanics from the game you can look out for, like throwing knives, climbing on ropes between buildings. I think there was even a Phantom Blade like Arno's at one point. 
There are a lot of things to look out for like that in the film, and I'm sure I missed quite a few. So if you know of any that I missed, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Do you agree with my own observations? Are some of the connections I made purposefully put in the movie, or just coincidence? What do you think? And before I sign off here to let you ponder all of these things, I want to thank you all for watching. I had a really fun time making this video, so I'd appreciate you giving it a like if you had a fun time too. I make a lot of videos about various video games like this, so why don't you subscribe too if you like gaming? But above all, whether you like, subscribe, or not, I just hope you have a groovy day.